so here we go myself and jeremy are here and uh jeremy is one of the members of the round table he's a wonderfully lucid and well lubricated thinker and his mind seems to always reach with the intelligence of the heart without saying too much i'd like to put the ball into jeremy's court i'm the bush whisperer and welcome dear jeremy hey how's it going uh so uh, uh thank you for anybody who's uh gonna be here to uh, watch this in the future so i was hoping to uh have sit down and have a conversation here with uh, bush whisper uh, about uh, himself and his life and his experiences um and uh and all of that <laughs> so hopefully it'll be uh hopefully it'll be super interesting well, let's fire away. I mean, um, cool. I don't really like talking about myself more than I have to. Yeah. But let's let's get a little sure. look under the hood and yeah. uh, let's look at what what can come out. Hopefully, there can be some uh, incentives for yeah. to consider training possibilities. Absolutely. So, you know, you know and, and another another reason that I wanted to do this is because. Um, I, so I, you, you were, you're the only person like you, uh, schematically that I know that I have, um, like a personal relationship with and not, not, not a lot of the people that I know, um, that are also interested in, uh, spirituality or, or growing themselves spiritually, investigating these types of things, uh, really know, know anything, uh, from the source about shamanism and uh you know some of the circles that i'm in it's 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 actually they, they kind of look at it or uh, with uh, uh not, not as like a joke per se but you know it, there, there's no there's no experience of it there and you know over here uh, at least in the west um I, I, it, there's not it doesn't seem to be a tradition of shamanism like there's not there's not the there's not the local shaman anywhere you know that I'm aware of uh, that you can go to for advice or or you know, other other things, and so um, you know hopefully we can uh, we through this conversation people can have a better understanding of um, of what a shaman is what a shaman is. Um, so from what I picked up uh, listening to you for a while now. I think, gosh, we've known it. I've known of you, and we've been talking to each other for almost a year or over a year now. Is that you? You you've had a lot of extreme kind of uh, experiences uh, in your life, starting from a very young age. And so, uh, how 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 was your childhood, and what you know what were what what led up to that one? Sorry, I can hear my child. Um, what led up to that one experience that you had when you were three? <clears throat> well, I imagine you're talking. I was three, hmm. by the way, and well. On that specific day, I was having an argument with someone that wasn't physical. And they were suggesting that I could lean over the water and get my boat. And I was having this telepathic argument with them saying, no, no, I can't do that. I'm going to fall in the water. And they were going, no, no, you'll be fine. You'll be okay. And I was like, no, no, it's not, it's not safe for me to do this. So they... I wasn't aware of it because it was so normal, but there was always somebody there talking to me. So I was never really alone. So I was technically convinced to drown. The same way as six months to a year later, I was convinced to put my fingers into the mains of a socket and get stuck in the wall till I blew up the substation like 50 meters from my house. Started a big fire that almost burnt down two houses. 
because the substation exploded. Big boom. Um, once again, telepathic argument with somebody that wasn't physical that was saying, hey, no, you should take a look for yourself. See what it's like. Stick your fingers in there. I was, I was like, no, no, I was told I mustn't put my fingers in there. They were like, come on, you can do it. You'll be fine. Come on, put your fingers in there. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not falling for that. They were like, convince me. In the end, I thought, well, what have I got to lose? So I put my fingers in there. So that was an electrocution that happened later on when I was three, maybe reaching towards four. Um, now, why was I never alone? Part of it, I would say, has got to do with the fact that my father, my brother, also had some kind of ESP, and my father and his mother and his father, who was Welsh, had been involved in some kind of what he called black magic. And he was involved, but my father called it black magic because he came from a Catholic background. His mother was a Catholic, but she was from a Celtic family, so she, the Shanahan family. So she also had the sight. And my father was born with what his mother had explained to him was the core. And children born with the core have an extra piece of skin over their head and they have foresight and see what's coming. So my father, um, so so, and my mother as well, also has um, an ability to see beings that aren't physical. Those like passed on. So part of it's genetic. And then another part of it is, if I go back to when I was really young, um, and I, I recreated my timeline by going to sit and meditate on the places where I was as a child in the mid-90s. I traveled around to all the places I'd been as a child, and I sat on the exact pieces of ground I'd been, and I meditated there to extract my memories from that ground, jump back onto my timeline, and start riding my timeline back towards my birth. So it's part of a part of a practice that you would do to to rebuild your timeline because you need to know where you've been in this life to know where you're going to understand perspective and so i remember my youth my childhood explicitly i remember the properties i lived in when i was months old i remember when my mom took me away from my father i remember the day i remember um ODing on medication um, when I was a child. I think it was sleeping pills or something. I got hold of them and I OD'd on them um, when I was less than a year old. Um, and that was when my mom, a little, sometime after that, my mom took me. And I remember the issues between my mom and my dad. And I remember how I would lie and my nappy would be sore. I didn't understand then. I just knew I was uncomfortable. And when I saw my dad, I'd be crying and crying to get his attention. And then he'd like look at my nappy and it'd be like a whole big hoo-ha between mom and dad. He'd be like, what the hell have you been doing? No, 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 you've been stoned all day. What's going on here? Look at my child's, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? So my dad would get home from work and and I'd, I'd feel. So I always had a really strong connection with my dad. My mom was very young when she had me, so she didn't have the the skill set and the full capacity. She was 17. Okay, by that time she was 18. But like imagine most 18-year-old girls. Yeah. Being a mother. I mean, you're you're now in a partnership with, with your partner, Lauren, and, and she's she's a woman. She can be a mother. But at 18. You know, I couldn't have been a dad at 18. Let's just put it that way. No ways. <laughs> so I just didn't have the mental, emotional capacity. Yeah. Probably not even, if I'm honest, even until my thir until I was 30, I don't think I had the capacity. Yeah. Not properly. Even 
I would say I only really started to get to what I considered capacity when I was reaching 40. Yep. So um, my mom took me from my dad. And I remember when she did it. And um, so I, I, I have a, a timeline that goes back to like a little while after I got out of the hospital. Before I could move my body. Before I could roll over. And I was just like pinned to the bed like this. That was my mobility. <laughs> you couldn't see behind you because you couldn't, you couldn't do that. Right. <laughs> you didn't know you could roll over. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so. Um, what I remember is this this elastic bond between my mother and my father, and I was like between them. And so what I was thinking and feeling was them. And so I remember all my mom's thoughts and feelings and that anxious, like nervous excitement. She wanted to go and become a dancer. And so she took me from my dad. And obviously my dad didn't know where I was. She had, I suppose, technically kidnapped me. They weren't technically married. So the, the, the laws and rights in those days for a father were different to what they are today if you weren't married. So anyway, she took me and um, I remember the flat we went to live in. First, we were staying with a friend of hers. I remember her friend. And then we were staying in a flat, which I remember like like every detail of that flat. And I was alone a lot. In fact, I was alone most of the time. And there wasn't any entertainment. There wasn't anything to do. So... And my mom didn't understand the needs of a child. So I was often hungry. So I learned to deal with hunger and those kind of things. How, how old are you at this stage? One. One. Wow. But I used to sit by the window. I mean, she used to leave me with her friends, with these other two children I remember, that I didn't like so much. I actually got to know them when I was older. They were friends of mine, Jethro and Buffy. But we were never close. Although I got on much better with Jethro, who was much older than me, because he was a drummer. But he was being like beaten by his stepfather badly. So I could like relate to him. Um, he was a good guy. He was much older than me. And he didn't mind having me around, even though I was much younger than him. Yeah. Because I liked listening to him play the drums. Yeah. He was always in his garage playing his drums. Yeah. So anyway... Um, I was alone a lot, and through the age of two, I would sit and look out of the window on my own, and I would stare out of the window, and I would contemplate. So I spent my, my young childhood contemplating things, because I didn't have external entertainment. I found inner entertainment. And um, so that's where beings befriended me. I was like a little yogi, fasting, practicing abstinence, living in a cave with nothing, being cold, being hungry as a, as a baby. So... I had already this connection with that. And I would often like look to see inside my mind where my father was. And he was far away. And I'd like call to my father. And somehow um, he found me. And when he found me, it was Hillbrow. Now, it was on the first floor, but there was a cutaway almost a one floor down cutaway to the basement where there was a parking bay. Yeah. Picture it on a steep hill of the flats. So the flats was on a steep hill and there was a huge cutaway on the steep hill, a flat cutaway where there was a parking bay. So it was like one and a half floors. I would say, um, 16 feet, 17 feet. And my dad found me, but he couldn't come into the building. 
and he came at like three in the morning and anyway my, my mom didn't understand i would i'd figured out i'd learned how to open those fridges because we're talking about the 70s now so the fridges were like these huge it wasn't easy to open those fridges but i'd figured out how that you had to pull this thing and press the button i'd learned how to do it and i'd get into the fridge and i'd like open every jar and put my fingers out and this taste okay this one tastes okay that was, uh, I'd learn to feed myself in the fridge and then my mom would come home and she'd be like freaking out because like, what are you doing? And she'd be slapping my hands and stuff. And I'd be like, remember, I remember thinking like an adult, like, why are you hitting me? Don't you understand? I'm hungry. <laughs> so I, I was somehow, I wasn't like other children to begin with because I could sort of see things from a different perspective. And anyway, my father rocked up and he, took three broomsticks and tied them together or taped them together, strapped them together. And he managed to tap on the windowsill by my window. And it was about three, four in the morning. Well, it was cold. And I remember the sun came up a little bit after. So it was like early in the morning. And I came to the window and I was just wearing underpants. I remember like the t-shirt was like lines. It was like baby blues, different colors, like mauve baby blue something like lines on my t-shirt you would think 70s thinking back it was quite a funky little vest it was a vest and like underpants with like little pictures on them like blue pictures what were they like little men bicycles by the bikes i don't know anyway and um he was like jump daddy catch and i was like looking down there my father was this tiny little guy down there and i was like down, down here are you serious he was like jump daddy catch jump daddy catch so i was like yeah okay so i jumped so i was doing crazy stuff as a little boy jumping from like I don't know, you know however many feet that was um 16 feet 17 feet at age two <laughs> maybe i was turning three and he caught me i remember he caught me and he wrapped me up in his coat. And anyway, he took me to a, a surgery and they were like, wanted to have him arrested. And then I had to speak to the doctor and explain that, um, no, because my dad had cried and tried to bribe him and everything. And the guy was like, I've got to phone the police. Uh, Cause I had like acute malnutrition. And it was like bad. And my dad explained to him, listen, I've just kidnapped my boy. You can't call the cops. They're going to send him back to his mother. Look at the state of it. Well, that's what I'm guessing. I remember him talking. I didn't really understand. But then the doctor made my dad leave the room. And he asked me, like, where were you staying? Who were you with? When did your dad? And my dad just said, answer honestly. And I answered all the questions. And the guy, remember, he gave my dad this big bag of stuff. My dad kept trying to give him money. He said, don't give me any money. I'm not writing you. I'm not writing this down. I remember him saying, I'm not writing this down. Um, and like basically the doctor was scared he could lose his license or something it was like this whole big story but anyway he wouldn't take any of my dad's money and he gave me this huge bag of stuff like to my dad explaining to him he's got to take this and this and this all these little tablets like nutrition you know different a whole batch and um so my dad got on the train and took me to cave town and hit me in an afrikaans area and so i was already like very different i'd lived a very different life and that was where i was in the crash no first i drowned we were staying in tigerberg flats which was across the road from tigerberg hospital luckily and that was where i drowned that was where i was by the pool he had met a lady who he had connected with after being there for a while and they had sort of fallen in love and she was becoming a nurse she wasn't quite qualified as a nurse yet but she was just about getting towards becoming qualified as a nurse and so she had to do some more practical experience or something she had been working at tigerberg hospital actually but as an intern if that makes sense and um i remember when he met her at the park my dad used to have all these women trying to run after him because <laughs> he was there with his little boy and the woman would fall in love with him because he was like he must have been like such a like 
people must have thought of that that guy's a model father you know <laughs> he was a pretty impressive father my dad so anyway um yeah so i drowned and when i drowned my whole world was dissolved thinking back i thought maybe i got a bit of brain damage a little bit um but then obviously my brain rewired because i was very young and after that my esp was ridiculous it was ridiculous and uh um because i had literally started to cross over all my memories had been stripped from me and i'd been wiped clean of my memories and then I had to come back and reabsorb those memories from the earth because the memories are like stored in the earth. So I came back like a blank slate. And then I was at a crash, and that was when my mom found me. I remember the day at the crash because I would draw a circle in the sand pit. And I'd step inside my circle and I'd sit cross-legged like a yogi with my hands, wrists on my knees and I'd just sit there. And none of the children would come near me. My circle wouldn't be, they'd all like, I like will them away. I wanted my little circle, my space. This is me, my circle. I'm in my circle. I never had to tell them to go away. They just knew, don't, don't disturb me. <laughs> and the teacher came to talk to me. I'll never forget it. She was the reason my mom found me. Because she came to ask me. She was like, like, don't you want to play with the other children? And I said to her, no, well, look at them. And I pointed at these kids rolling around in the dirt. And I said, like, why aren't you playing with them? And she laughed. Like, well, I said, well, look at them. Why would I want to do that? She said, yeah, but are you happy? I said, yes. She said, but you're all alone. I said, well, I'm sitting here. What are you doing? I'm thinking. She was like, what are you thinking about? Thinking about how everybody is so scared of dying that they forget to live their life and they forget to be happy. And so they are like lost and confused because the fear of dying has stopped them from enjoying their lives. And she stopped. And she got nervous. And I, I think I asked her a direct question, like, like, aren't you scared of dying? How do you think that impacts your life? And it was a bit much for her. It was an overload for her. She wasn't expecting this from a, from a three-year-old. And um, so she was like, well, try and play with the children. And I was looking at these kids. I was like, you're kidding me. So I was like, okay. You know, she went off. And I thought, I'll try and play with the kids. So I figured... I know, let's write on the wall. <laughs> so I got red crayon and started writing on the wall. The other children said, you can't write on the wall. I said, of course you can. Watch this. She started writing on the wall. It's easy. It's like that. You can all do it. Come on. What are you scared of? So anyway, all the children started doing artwork on the wall. And um, I remembered I was right. Oh, I could read and write before I turned four. My dad had been reading the Bible with me and I was learning to read letters and numbers and stuff. By the time I was five, I'd read the Bible two and a half times, from cover to cover. And I didn't write in cursive, I wrote it in print. It was a problem when I went to school, I was too advanced. Because my dad, every night and every morning, we would read the Bible for half an hour and I would read the words. So, yeah, so that, that's my early life. And, and I was writing numbers and letters on the wall, and I was thinking about my mother. I w was wondering what had happened to her, because I was under the impression she was dead. She had had a dream that I was writing on the wall with red. That's how she knew to tell the private detectives where to go and look for me. A little while later, they found me. And so my whole world again. 
Well, why don't we, why don't we, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll around a little bit here? So, um, so it seems like there's, uh, to go back to your family's roots, you said, um, that your, your dad was, uh, had a Welsh background. His family had a Welsh background or was that your mom or both? My father, um, actually came from a line of prize fighters. Yeah. So his mother was Irish. Okay. And her side of the family was an Irish Shanahan family. What does that mean? Which Shanahan? Is a, Shanahan is a very old Celtic lineage. Okay. Bloodline. Huh. And um, my father's father's side of the family was Williams, Welsh. My mother's side of the of the lineage was her father had Prussian roots and um, European roots, combination between Prussian and Dutch. And my mother's mother had, I believe, French and British roots, but French roots. A lot of so there's combination of French, Prussian, European roots. Um, Prussian being I'm not, I don't know so much about Prussia, but it was important to my grandfather. Yeah, about his lineage. And how so? How, how did all that uh, get to South Africa? My father's mother. And her husband had emigrated to South Africa, I believe, when they were young. And much of the family had come across to settle in Durban. My mother's side of the family had been in South Africa for a while, longer. So my father's side had been here less. For less long um yeah so i remember i remember you telling me um a while ago about when before your uh before your son um came into the world that his his spirit or something like that, like uh, poked through into your consciousness and, and it, it made itself known uh, that he was coming. And that when the way you were describing this, um, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking the, the circumstances that you were in as a young, as a baby, you know, basically as a baby, this, this ascetic life, you know, living in <laughs> hungry and stuff like that. Um, I didn't see it like that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I understand. Um, Without that, I wouldn't have been able to live the life I've lived. I know, right? And so it's interesting that, I, you know, it just, it makes, it, you know, it makes me wonder, it's like whatever, wherever you were before was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, go into the situation so that I can become what you are now. And you had to, you had to start, you had to start right away. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. What, what was talking to you to lead you into the pool, to put your fingers in the socket? How, when did you become aware? Was it just was it just voices? Were you seeing things? Did they just there were beings. say hello? There were beings. Start, they're, yeah, they're, they're beings, yeah. So how did that and, all start? Um, look, there were a lot of beings around me. My I was exercised between the age of 
four and seven, I was exercised something like seven times, six, at least six, six or seven times. Um, because my dad got scared. Because I would tell him, like, these beings are like... So at night when I went to sleep, there were beings looking for me. And, and so I could see into the the ether as a child. Because I had passed over, I could see between the worlds. And it caused a lot of trouble for me. I was called the devil's cunt. I was called the devil's child. I wasn't allowed. Oh, I had to be an ascetic more. Because then because I drowned, I wasn't allowed to play with other children. Because I had like premonitions. Um, I'd see what was going to happen. I'd tell people like, uh, you're going to have a car accident on that day. On that date, you're going to be driving there. That's where it's going to happen. And you're going to die at that time of day. And then it happens. And the whole neighborhood's talking about it. And I'll never forget the first day we arrived at our house in Duncan Street. My dad took me across the road to go and introduce us to, to meet everybody. This was the, the night that we're moving into our house. We go across to a gated community, and everybody's having a barbecue. Everybody knows it's everybody. It's like a gated, I wouldn't call it a block of flats. I'd call it more like a small, what do you call it? Condominiums. Okay. Like a, a group of condominiums that have a, like a big shared garden kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right? And anyway. We go in there and everybody's there and my dad's introducing me and everybody's making a barbecue. And my dad, of course, everybody loves my dad because he was hilarious. He was a comedian. He probably had a guitar with him. Yes, he had a guitar. And he's playing guitar and he's telling jokes. My dad was like a laugh per minute kind of character. You'd fall off your chair laughing. He was that funny. Super. Gosh, if I went to a bar with my dad and I went to go and have a pee, I'd come out, I'd follow the laughter. That's how I found my dad. He'd have a group of people around him and they're laughing. And then everybody wants to buy us drinks. And like now my dad's like, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here because people won't let us leave. They're like just lining up drinks. And uh, <laughs> we're going to get drunk if we don't get out of there. <laughs> it's like, my dad's like, we, we get out the back years. door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. People lining up drinks because they, they, they don't want us to leave because my dad's telling stories. He was funny. He was funny. He was a character. He was a real character. Proper Irish, you know, mentality. Like Always on the crack, as they say. So anyway, you're part Irish. Uh, no. Aren't you? No. Uh, no, I got a Italian, Filipino, um, Polish, and uh, that's as far as I know. Are you sure? But, okay. I mean, I'm not um, sure, sure, but I mean, that's as, that's as much as I know. Something in your accent makes me think that. Very weird. Like something in your accent, because um, you you can hear there's like a, a background of like something. Who knows? Maybe it's a past life connection with with those lands. But so anyway, this this first we arrive there, and people are talking to me, the adults, and I'm talking to them. I was a very open, like my son this morning. My son, we come down the mountain. And he looks over the wall, and there's three kids. And he was ahead of me. I stopped. I like gave him water. I was drinking water, putting the water back in the bag. And he runs across the street, just at the bottom of the foot of the mountain. There's a road there. He goes over, and he calls the kids. He says, come here. Come talk to me. <laughs> so the three kids come over. He has no social inhibitions. He starts talking to them. He's like, oh, he's, he's, he's really funny. And so he introduces himself. And it's like, I'm Joshua Eli, not Joshua, Joshua Eli. He's, he's funny like that. And um, he starts talking to these children. So, yeah, we, we should make it. We should set up a play date, this and that. And, and uh, he says to the one girl, what, is, what does he say to her? He says to her, he's so, he's so sharp. He says to her, within 10 seconds of talk, starting the conversation, he looks at the one girl, he looks into her eyes, and he says, What's the word he says? Not anxious. He says, you are um, 
a word like anxious, sort of quite a little slightly adult word, more adult than that. Yeah. And um, he looks into her eyes and says that. He says, why? Why are you like this? What's wrong? What's happened? She's like, she's a bit older than him. Yeah. She's like, no, no. He says, yes, I can see in your eyes. You look unhappy. Why are you unhappy? What happened? She's like, I I I'm not unhappy. <laughs> but he picked up what a therapist would have taken two or three sessions to figure out with her by looking at her eyes, reading her body language, instantly knowing what was, there's something wrong here. And it was clear that this child did have a future depression coming on because of their upbringing and their home situation. So, but anyway, my point is he'll he'll go and introduce himself. He'll go to a park. He knows no children there, and he'll go and just fit in with that social circle. He really doesn't give a damn what they think. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's coming to play with him. That's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's hilarious. He's, he's no inhibitions. You know, he's just being himself, having fun. So anyway, I was like that too as a child. I had no inhibitions, and um, so I'm speaking to these adults. And I said to them, well, I can see ghosts. And, of course, they're all laughing. Ha, oh, you can see ghosts. Yeah, yeah, I can see ghosts. And they said, oh, well, what ghost do you see? And I said to him, well, you see that window up top there? There's a ghost in there. And he died. And I tell them the date that he died. And I say that he died because he was stabbed in the back twice. His name, I tell them his name. And I say to them, he was stabbed in the back twice. And I tell them the person who stabbed him in the back. And the whole circle of about 15 people goes silent. And this is uncomfortable nervousness. And the people are like, uh, uh, Frankie, Frankie. Uh, to my father, his name was also Franklin. Uh, do, do, do you mind uh, just taking your son and going, please, please, just, just, just go, please? They were so scared because it turned out there had been this had happened when I said it had happened, and that guy it had happened, and he had been murdered, and nobody knew who the murderer was. Well, now they did. They obviously knew the person I'd named, some of them, and it made them very nervous. Um, because like I'm saying, I can see ghosts and now they know that there is a ghost there, but they live here. <laughs> so that was the day we moved in. And from then on, there were like a whole lot of situations, you know, my neighbor, I said, when he would pass, how he would pass, where he would pass and told people secrets. They couldn't have secrets. Like I said, like, you've got another wife. Yeah. What wife? And I told his wife. He was with her. And I somehow could tell her the name of the hotel and the room number and the date when he was there and what the name of the woman was. And I explained to her, it's your friend with the blonde hair. You know her. And this is like the first time they met me. And she freaks out. They're having an argument now. We were like, supper. We come to them for supper. There are people that met my father through church because my father's a gospel musician. They're somehow important people in some church. And I, anyway... I really got on well with their little daughter. We played so nicely. I really liked her. She was really cool. And now I never got to see her again. And like I was told that they, they were getting a divorce now. So like she moved away with her mother. Her mother took her away because she found out. that. So the, these kind of things were happening. And then the children, um, I could somehow connect with the children telepathically. And we would go into like, one mind and we could talk with one voice we would all be in a trance so we'd all, like a whole four or five of us talking with one voice like in stereo and the adults would get really freaked out and they were like this isn't right they did that i saw that done in a movie uh, many years later in a movie called um poltergeist and i saw that i was like hey that, that that's what happened no wonder those people were so damn scared of me <laughs> So the people who were scared of me as a child, they'd, they'd cross over the other side of the road if they saw me coming. They were scared I'd see their secrets. Do you remember what you would talk about? when? I imagine that you were... So, okay. I would just have a vision and tell them what I was seeing. 
Right. And it would be all the other kids talking with you? Oh, no. When we spoke, um, uh, I can't remember exactly what we would talk about. Yeah. But we would just talk. It would be like the parent would come in and ask a question and we would all talk in one voice. <laughs> and the parent would say, what's going on? And we would all talk in one voice. So we were one person having a conversation with a parent, but like there's four or five kids and we're speaking in stereo and this is freaking the hell out of the parent. And we're laughing our tits off because it's hilarious. Because <laughs> like, I've said to the kids, there's this thing we can do. If we like really concentrate, we can like speak like one person, all of us. Yeah. And so we were like able to telepathically link our minds and become like one person and talk like that, like a group of us. Yeah. So anyway, I was labeled as devil's, devil's child. I was possessed and I couldn't play with the other children yeah. except yeah. for one child up to a point. And then even his mom got scared. Yeah. Uh, it re you reminded me of um, uh, this experience I had in, New York and Syracuse. Uh, I had made a I had made a friend out there while working in the um, uh, the, the tree. Uh, I worked for this company. Uh, did that uh, did tree work. You know, like taking down trees and you know uh, digging up stumps and all this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, I became really good friends with with, with my uh, my foreman. And I would go over his house and you know we hang out a lot. And he had a little girl. Um, was she like three or three or four at the time? And the house, the the, the house, the property that he was living on was uh, his grandparents, um, now deceased. And his, his, according to him, his family had been in the area for uh, a long time, like a long time, like Revolutionary War, you know, time, long time, and. Um, like they would dig up, he, he, they would dig up, he would be able to dig up uh, spear points and like arrowheads uh, from the natives that lived, that, you know, used to live in the area and stuff like that. But um, his, his grandparents, or at least his grandfather would, would still hang around the house. <laughs> um, and, and there was, his presence would be there. Um, and we were, Right before uh, my, you know, Lauren and I left, we were hanging out at the house there one evening, and just, just you know, hanging out and talking. And um, in his living room, in his living room there, he he had his old his grandfather's chair. It was a wooden chair, very nice chair. Um, and then behind the chair was uh, was a portrait of uh, a picture of uh, his grandfather and his grandma. And we were talking, and I remember I was looking at the chair, and I just I felt compelled to like sit in the chair, you know, and and so I I, I sat in the chair, and I was I was I was talking to my buddy, and um, I started to feel I started to feel weird, like um, like my body was was like buzzing a little bit, and his little girl. <laughs> Like it was like your whole body was moving. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. It, it started to feel transitional. Um, and his little girl comes over to me, and she's she's right in front of me, and she she kind of like climbs on my lap a little bit, and she's looking right at me, and she points. She didn't say anything. She just points over my shoulder at the at the picture. And, and then and then she goes away and I, and at, and at that point that I, I really I really started feeling I don't know whatever it was I was feeling I was like I was like okay I was like okay and I and I got up from the chair uh, and I, you know it, it was fine um, but uh, yeah you, you reminded me of that experience and like the the little girl uh, my buddy would tell me all the time that you know she would she would be able to see grandpa or or some other people you know and then she would she would point them out <laughs>
Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was you mentioned, uh, you know, drawing a circle and, and sitting in the middle of it and did, uh, as a kid. And did that, did you learn about that or did you just know to, to do that? And, and, and what does that, and, and then what does that do, the, the circle? I didn't learn about it. Look, when I slept at night, I lived another life. This was one of the things that freaked my dad out. I kept telling my dad, dad, I got another life. I was like, what do you mean? Like when I go to sleep, here, I'm living there, but I'm a big man. I've got a horse. I've got a big sword. It's called a katana. I've got all my men. I'm like, I'm a, I'm, I'm like, got to be responsible for all my men. And there's this woman. And I told my dad the whole story. And I said to him, and I keep remembering how I die. My dad was like, what? <laughs> So I kept reliving that death and I, I really relived other things. So I was obviously learning stuff from my past lives, but I never learned it in this life. So the same as like, uh, I went for a judo class once. Turns out I'm a high senior grade in judo. I got a senior grade in judo. I went for one class. Unprecedented. I got graded three years of grading on my first lesson. And my teacher was convinced that I'd been trained by some master. And he wanted to meet him. And I kept saying, there isn't one. And he, he basically had got to the point where he was harassing me at school. I had to get my parents, my mom, to like write a letter to the school and ask him to leave me alone because there wasn't another teacher. And he had given me this high grade. I couldn't go back to the class because all the children were completely jealous of me. And um, I didn't want to do judo. The school had recommended I do it because my first day of school, the big bully came to bully me. And I tried to get away. I tried to walk away. I tried to this and that. And he wouldn't. He kept coming at me. And he was a big boy. So I had to jump up. My dad had taught me to fight when I was little, coming from a boxing family. And I hospitalized him. But I was only nine, so it was a big deal because he had to go to, to, for surgery. And they wanted to expel me. And I was like, no, I only hit him once. He was a bully. Do you know what I mean? What do you want? <laughs> he was bullying me. I, I tried to get away. He wouldn't leave me alone. I tried to walk away. I tried to escape. I tried. To, he decided he was going to bully me. And I asked him three times, please leave me alone, uh, like my dad had taught me. And then I jumped up in the air and I hit him. <laughs> so anyway they, they wanted me to go and do judo so I went for one judo class which was a grading and the boy I was grading with who'd been training for like five five years something five six years however long five six years he was a very high senior grade and the, the judo teacher said I'm going to put you with him he's much bigger than you and he's a senior he won't hurt you but I like I wiped the floor with this guy threw him around he couldn't stand on his feet so I kept throwing him dish 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 so that like you know this the sensei assumed that i'd been trained and he kept talking about that classical technique that you're doing where did you learn it i've, ne I've only read about it i've seen it in books where did you learn it and i was like what do you mean <laughs> so um that and other things you know, certain occult things I learned in past lives and, and other martial arts I learned in past lives. And my katana, I never trained with a katana, ever. Well, when I bought my katana and I held it in my hand, I could feel the forms and I could feel how to move with this katana. I can remember how to move with it, how to strike, how to block. I, just, I can just remember. <laughs> so I just knew how to draw the circle because I'd done it so much somewhere else. Yeah. And um, so why do you draw a circle? Well, 
the circle represents the Ouroboros. This isn't why I was drawing it, but this is why one would draw a circle, because it represents the Ouroboros. And the Ouroboros represents the head of the serpent Leo and the tail of the serpent Cancer closing. So you're recreating the circle of the heavens around yourself, which makes you the Axis Mundi in your circle. And the Axis Mundi being the, the tree of life that center of the universe and then by you becoming the center of that little universe that you're creating you align with the center of the universe and so there's an infinite scale of power moving around you through you which is why occultists cast circles they're channeling the axis mundi power is it um is it also like a like a barrier, um, like a protective? Sort? That's an exoteric way of looking at it. Yeah. Yes, it is, but on a more esoteric level, you're channeling the power of the center of the universe. Right. The toric field, the very power that that becomes manifestation, you're channeling that through you. And when you channel that through you, you can walk through barriers. And you become the barrier. The universe that you are, are creating within yourself is a barrier. But it's represented on the line as well. But on an esoteric level, it's more of an alignment with a particular vibrational field that you are vibrating at that pitch. And because you're vibrating at that pitch, nothing can enter into your field of vibration because your harmonic signature is too consistent. What I'm, pick, what I'm picking up is um, like you draw the, you, you sit and you draw the circle. It's just, it's, it's, it's a material thing. It's just a, a line. It's just uh, yeah. the, the, the shadow and the contrast and a, a depression that you move with your finger. Yeah. But for for you and your in, internal state, it's like you you now have you now have created something. You've created something outside of yourself, and because of how you're thinking about it, you're you're making it also inside that represents all these things, the editorial field and, and the Leo and the Cancer and the Oral Boros. Um, and it, it like... Um, it's what the magician in the magician card wears around his waist. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the tarot card. Yeah. I'll have to look at that one. Uh, so I've never, I never heard about the closing of Leo and Cancer. What, what is that? Leo is the house of, of work and vocation and career. It's the fifth house representing. And Cancer is the house of home family. So Cancer is where you've come from. And Leo is where you're going. So on a metaphysical, metaphorical term, it has resonance frequencies with the head of the dragon and the tail of the dragon, what they call Ketu in Sanskrit um, cosmology, which is the north node and the south node of the moon. And so there's this association, and you can see it in the numbers, like the manifestational qualities of the sun is one. And the manifestational quality of the moon is two. But the manifestational quality of, of the south node is, is seven. And the manifestational quality of the north node is four. So um, these elements 
are connected because four can be used as a number for the sun or one, but generally one. And seven has also got a lunar resonance in the way that it manifests. Even though it implies Venus, it has a manifestation of the lunar principles. But it's the south node from Vedic astrology as well. So there's this associations between these numbers that sort of pin it down. And so Leo is and Cancer are at the apex of the wheel. So if you consider the proverbial summer, that's Cancer and Leo. So Cancer and Leo are both at, both at the apex of the turning of the wheel. And so it is considered that where you're moving towards is your vocation and your career as that house. That's what you're going towards. It's what you're going to learn in this life. Those are the skill sets you're going to develop. That's what's going to shape who you become. And where you come from, the South Node, is your family and your home life, which has shaped the conditions of who you've become, why you move towards that career, if that makes sense. And so that is your path through life, your vocation and your home and family life. The Cancer and Leo are the only two signs that um, relate to the sun and the moon. The other 10 signs are polarized. So you've got Venus, which has got two poles, Libra and Taurus. Mercury's got Gemini and Virgo. Uh, Jupiter's got Sagittarius and Pisces. Saturn's got Aquarius and Capricorn. When's your birthday, by the way? Uh, it's June 1st. June the 1st, yeah? Gemini. Um, so and told. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what have we not mentioned? Um, Mars is Aries and, and Scorpio. Now, the sun doesn't have this. And the moon doesn't have this. So the sun is merely Leo. That's all it is. And the sun, instead of having a polarity or a polarizing effect, its polarizing effect is the lunar, the moon. And the moon is cancer. So the sun and the moon have these special places. And Leo and cancer have these special places where there are no other polarities of those two planets. So they become each other's matrimonial connection. So the sun is married to the moon. It seems like... Where... Yeah? I was just thinking, um, when you take... Where you... Leo... Leo cancer... And you take where you're from to where you're going... And then you, you collapse the circuit and you are the Axis Mundi. However much, however much uh, personal power you have can, can radiate out and, and move that circuit. Um, why, why is the oral burrows represented as a, a, um, a serpent or a dragon? Because that's the sign of Leo. Look at Leo's glyph. Let me, let me pull it up. Leo glyph. You can literally see it. It's a serpent. Um, not a lion yeah now lately there's a circle attached to it but there's it's very interesting um, there's an old way of drawing it which is literally more in alignment with teth and um, let me try and find some of the older pictures which are more commonly known 
is the problem with the internet, you know? Yeah, you need some old books. Um, yeah, we go. So you'll see here what I'm talking about now. Um, present, share screen, done. And there we go. So you can see that. Okay. That's literally a... Can you see it's a serpent? Yeah. And and so Leo represents that as 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 a fundamental um image and it comes from the Hebrew letter that relates to this is tet. Mm -hmm. And tet is I suppose where the word teat comes from as well. So you see it's bound in cancer. Mother teat tet breast and the breast is ruled by cancer. Leo is the spine, and the heart. But the, the letter Teth, which is related to the tarot card of strength, that, that letter means serpent. You're saying that teth? old Teth. And that's Teth, and that's a letter? Yeah. In what language? Paleo Hebrew. Paleo Hebrew. And it comes from the old Chaldean and from the old, 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 old going to Phoenicia when they were images before they became alphabetical letters and it was a serpent. And so the word today for that alphabetical letter, which relates to the astrological sign of Leo, is Tet, which means serpent. Like cancer is Chet. And Chet means an enclosure right so imagine the energy of the serpent needs to be have some way to to move so the energy of the sense of the serpent which is the strength of creation needs to find a place to move in order for it to be encapsulated and that place needs to be an enclosure of forms and so het the sign of cancer is symbolized by the 6 and the 9 Now we're looking at six and nine, why they're relevant. We think about Tesla, the three, the six, and the nine. So the six and the nine is the place where the serpent, which represents, we spoke about it, the triple goddess, the power of the triple goddess, needs to be expressed. And it's expressed in the form of serpentine kundalini energy. And this kundalini serpentine energy needs to be expressed in a place. So the three, the six, and the nine need to fit together in order for creation to come into being. And so cancer holds the keys of the six and the nine. And it's in the glyph. So, so yeah. So to go back to um, um, you sitting in your circle, why did you specifically draw that circle? I just knew. You just knew. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, 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 I just, um, these beings were also teaching me stuff. Huh. There was, okay, so there were these beings that would come looking for me and I knew they weren't good. And on the astral plane, they looked like big black kind of creatures. I can remember them as almost being like a huge black kind of a cat, but there was something unnatural about the way they moved. And when they came looking for me, that was when I was outside of my body, but I, I was like stuck and I sensed them coming, looking at them. They were like sniffing. My son named these creatures Spitty. That's what he calls them because he used to see them. And I completely get where he's coming from with Spitty because they've got this duck. Like, 
sniffing and coughing and spitting and yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so he called them spitties because he said that they were like spitting. <laughs> <laughs> I was giggling at like quite creative little. He's he's even naming his his night beings, and um, because he used to tell me about all the beings he would see, and uh, he he also got the the sensitivity. It's closed down now, as it as it as it does as it must at a certain age to reawaken again probably when he's about 11 or 12 but um so anyway i just knew to draw these circles because these beings were with me and when these beings came looking for me i would feel this sort of almost like like i really don't want them to find me and i, I was like i'm not ready to deal with them I'm not ready to yeah you know, to pace them and my little guy would come. I didn't know it was a leprechaun. I didn't know what a leprechaun was. But this little guy would come with his funky bright suit and he'd dance. And he'd do this cool dance. And he'd go and start dancing and he'd start, he'd go wild. He'd be like this thunderstorm of dance movement and he'd be like all over the shop. And whenever he came to dance, I was like, wow, like when he's dancing, they can't find me. It's like he's doing some kind of a magical dance that makes them confused and they can't come near me because his dance puts like a pushes them away. So they would come and dance in my space and they wouldn't be able to come near me. And so that was my special little guy. And I was telling my dad, there's this little guy that comes, he dances for me. He's so cool, dad. He's my friend. He protects me from those big beings. And I was like, what do you mean big beings? Oh, those big like, dark things those cat things that are trying to find me and they they're all looking for me and they they want me but he won't let them touch me my dad was like this isn't right <laughs> <laughs> so that's when the exorcism like was happening and like the fact that i was being a devil's child and i was not playing with the other children was like disturbing my father yeah so did you explain and uh, I mean, and tell me about your your exorcisms. Like, what what was that like? How how did that go down? Did anything happen? Were you just like sitting there, just like, okay? <laughs> I I used to tell my dad, Dad, these guys have got evil spirits on them. My dad didn't listen. I was like, Dad, look at them. Look, there's things on top of these men. And then my dad, I said, Dad, don't leave me alone in the room with this man. Like, I wouldn't let my dad leave me alone in the room with him. Catholic priests. They were dark. They had dirty auras. They had entities attached to them. Um, and they, they'd come at me with their Latin and all their nonsense. And they'd carry on chanting their Latin, and sometimes they'd slap me. And I'd be like, why are you slapping me? What's wrong with you? <laughs> they, like, they, they get physical with you, by the way. Yeah. They're like slapping the evil spirit out of you sometimes. And they're chanting, and they're going crazy. And that was where I learned about Frank. That what I enjoyed about it was I really loved the frankincense. I was like, oh, what is that? I was like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> that was like the part I looked forward to was then coming to burn the frankincense because I was like that that I really enjoyed. Fell in love with frankincense at that age because I knew that stuff smelt so divine. I couldn't get enough of that. But yeah, they they came and did it again and again and again. And I kept explaining to my dad, dad, there's nothing wrong with me, but there's something wrong with these men. They need help. My dad didn't get it. He was like, no, 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 those are priests. I said, no, Dad. These men have got evil spirits on them. I can see them. I could see the things sitting on their bodies. So, yeah, the, that's what the exorcisms were. So, <laughs> so they could, um, these priests could burn frankincense, and the frankincense would not have an effect on the 
the spirits that the evil spirits that were attached to him? I didn't have a problem. I was just very psychically open. No, no. I mean, what I'm what I'm saying is that these these priests would they would burn the incense, the frankincense, and the frankincense that that smell that they're burning it wouldn't have an effect on the evil spirits that are attached to the priests. Um, I think it did. Okay. I think it did. It made it that they couldn't be active in the space. But those men had, they must have had like carnal desires that they were repressing that I could see. Yeah. And I was pretty sure that I couldn't be left alone with some of those men. There were different priests that came. Not, not all of them were bad, if, if I want to be honest. Right. Like, you see, my dad found, uh, I went to the one Catholic church and he got this exorcist. And my dad traveled all around the whole of Cape Town to every different Catholic church and he found like exorcists here and there. He got every ca exorcist in Cape Town to come. There weren't many. And he got into a lot of trouble with the church. Because he went to that church far away and got that priest to come out. And my dad, like, arranged transport, please come out. And, you know, and then he went there and he got that one. And they didn't know. And then in the end, they they all knew about my dad. And they found out. My dad said, oh, please, man, I need it again. And they were like, no, 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 no. You went to that priest and you went to that priest and you went to that priest. We told you, like, it's done. So you're not supposed to be able to do it again and again and again. It's not like a... um cleaning service <laughs> so my dad got into a lot of trouble with the church for doing that he probably had to pay them a lot of money you know what the catholic church is like absolve oh, the, the sin yeah uh gosh i, I forgot what I, was, I was gonna say um so were were these were these entities that were these beings that were were talking to you? They, you know, talking to you when you were three, and then and then later, uh, they they were, you know they were trying to convince you to, or they convinced you to put your, your fingers in the sockets. Um, were they were they they were trying to kill you? They were trying to convince you convince you to kill yourself. Is that what they were trying to do? I have my doubts. I have my doubts. Okay. Were they testing you? Was it like a test? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what happened when I put my fingers in the socket. Mm -hmm. I put my fingers in the socket and immediately, I, so I'd have to go out of my body. I'd stand next to my body and I could think. My body's like doing that, like all that stuff. But I'm like not quite in the same time as my body. I could stand outside my body and I could rationalize. I go into my body and I'd be, I get out of my body. Okay. And so I'm trying to figure out what to do. What am I going to do? So I'm like, no, I'm going to go in my body. I'm going to pull my fingers out. I go back in. I can't pull my fingers out. And I was like, I'm trying everything. I went in, I went out. I must have gone in and out of my body about four or five times. And then a being like was saying to me, listen, you got to do this now. So I went into my body. I created the intention outside of my body that I was going to scream down that line of electricity with all of my mind. I'm going to push my mind with all my power and I'm going to scream inside my mind. Scream down that line. And as I came into my body and I was dead, I screamed with all my power all my focus down the line where the electricity was coming from. And as I screamed, there was this huge bang. And it stopped. Like I had to, I had to force the electricity to go back on itself. And that's when that substation blew up. I screamed the power back and it blew up a substation. And that's when the fire started. And nobody had electricity for like a day or two in my in my road. <laughs> like I, I the whole substation burned. 
so yeah, to replace the entire substation. Yeah. So these beings convince you as a child to put your fingers in the socket and then they told you how to get out of it. Yeah. Huh. And what do you and think? when I drowned, I always tried to figure out who was I always I was considering this as a child. Why did they make me drown? Because when I came out, I knew I was different. Like to what I was before. I was like, this is interesting. I'm not the same now. And then when I was five years old, so fast track a little bit forward, my mom comes and she takes me away from my dad for a while. My dad's trying to fight to get me to come back home. And it's, you know what court's like. Nothing happens fast. So for a time, I'm with my mom, and I'm in the forest at a place called Sekabosi, where she's now been trained as a ballet dancer. Because when I was young, she was doing, like, dancing, like a bit of, you know, cabaret, like whatever. She acted in a movie that was like, oh, because they were wearing like 90s in the movie. It was a French film she was in. Not a weird movie, but like it was like avant-garde for its day. And she had done like exotic dancing to put herself through ballet school to become a ballet dancer. Now, fast track, she's in Cape Town. She's found me. She brought me back. She's now a ballet dancer. And her ballet dancer partner and her are living in this cottage by the woods. And he works as a lumberjack part-time to stay fit and earn extra money while he's there. But he, he's a lumberjack in the, in the woods. And um, so I'm now in this cottage with my mom and him. And these beings are with me. And they're like, come with us. So they take me off into the forest. And they explain to me, your mother can't think about you now. We've, we've we've made it that she can't she can't think about you. Don't worry, you have to worry about her. She won't be able to even remember you. Like they put some kind of a barrier around me, so my mom's mind can't reach out to touch me. And you were like, "Don't worry, we we haven't had this. I haven't had this problem before." <laughs> no, well, because I can feel my mom's thoughts in my mind if I'm going away and she's worried about me. But like she's not there, and they explain to me that they've made it that she won't worry. It's all good. So they take me into the woods, and then they were like teaching me, like now what you do is you sit down and you call, call this animal, and then I'd like call this creature out of the woods, and it would come to me, and it would like go on my hands, snakes, spiders, scorpions, um, different creatures would come to me, and they would sit with me, and they'd be like. My, my friends. And then when the creature comes, this, the, the being can talk to me through the creature. When you say calling, are you, is this, is this like a telepathic thing? Or are you actually vocalizing? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's like you're imagining a scorpion or you're imagining in your mind a snake. Like I can feel him out there. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. I've just got to call him to me and he'll come to me. Like my guides. But they're coming in physical form. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what a shaman is. I didn't know anything. I remember being with my mom's friends. <clears throat> well, sorry, they were always I, saying... Sorry, I, just wanna, I just want to pause real quick. I, because I, I'm, I'm nodding because I feel like I understand what you're talking about because... I, I I went so there there was something there was a little ritual that I wanted to do. This is when I was in New York, and I had a, a roughly an idea of where I wanted to do it in the woods. And as I'm walking up the hill, I I can like I can feel the direction. And there's other 
there's other visual cues and audio cues. There's actually some crows that were in this direction. And um, I, eventually, I, 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 I was with Lauren, and there was a point where I was like, okay, I, I'm going to go in here. She's going to go off. And she's just reading a book or something. And I get to this this point. I'm alone in the woods here, and there's this like log or this like trunk that had fallen over, and it was like this. It was like perfect. I was like, oh yeah, this is the, the threshold. I take my shoes off. I go over, and I walk a little bit, and then I find this tree with orange leaves. Um, and then underneath this tree, there's like a smaller stump. And I was like, this is the place. I'm not, I'm not trying to say this is like, you know, for my ego or anything like that. But I think I, I, I get a sense of what you mean by, uh, you, you could, you could feel, you can feel these things out in the woods. Because it, it really is. It's like a it's like a pool. It's like you're you're pooled. It's very yeah. it's subtle. Yeah. 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 It's almost like there's a piece of you out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you're following yourself. Yeah. So yeah, the, the guides were with me for a while and then and then they were telling me they had to go away and I was crying. I was crying and I was arguing with them and saying, why do you have to go away? You're my friends. They said, no, no, we have to go away. And I was crying. I was saying, I don't want you to go away. They were, look, we've got to go away, but we're going to come back again. But we need you to do something for us. And we need you to call your friend the scorpion. So I like I call my friend the scorpion. And he comes and he climbs on my hand. And black scorpion. And um, they're like, now you need to go and give that to your mother. It's a parting gift. And I'm like, I don't think it's I don't think it's unusual. I'm like, yeah, cool. I'm gonna go give my mom my gift. So I'm carefully carrying my little friend through the woods to my mom. And then I come to my mom and I'm like, mom, yeah, for you. It's a present for you. And I, I hand her <laughs> a scorpion. And um, she screams and she hits my hand. She hits my hand. My mom had very quick reflexes. She's a dancer. Uh, Flying trapeze, acrobatics, re refined reflexes. So she instantly hits my hand and the scorpion goes flying. And I'm like, no. But in that moment, she transmits fear into my body. And I feel it like vibrations changing. I feel this feeling and it's going and it's spreading through my body. And as it's spreading, my like my vibrations changing, and I'm like, hold on, my vibrations changing. And next thing, there's this weird sound I'm hearing, and it's like that's my voice I'm screaming with my mother. And she's telling me that thing's dangerous. You can't play with it; it'll kill you. It'll, she, whatever she's saying, it's like this traumatic thing. But I'm all I can feel is this change of this frequency in my body, and that's like the first time I was ever afraid. What do you mean that was the first time you were afraid? The first time I ever felt fear. In your life? At that point? Look, don't get me wrong. Um, I was like, I thought I was afraid to jump out of the window to be with my dad. Right. But it's not quite the same. You were more aware of like the consequences of an action. Than you, than you were yeah. actually like fear. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that was the first time I felt fear. Hmm. 
and you got it from your mom. Yeah. Hmm. It was like a genetic activation. What was different after that? Well, my guides went away. Huh. They, they made me do that so that I could feel the fear so that I would close my energy centers. As they explained to me, they had to go away. Yeah. They said it's time for us to go. You're like, they had been like, it was like school when our school was done. And they said, we'll be back later, but not now. And how old were you? Five. Five. Five, six. It's pretty much when my son stopped seeing the spitties. So why do they why do they go away? Hey, why do they go away? Because my vibrational body had shifted. What does that mean? Your consciousness is a vibrational field. That's a tone, and depending on the tone of your vibrational field depends on what you can resonate with. And because the fear had entered into my body, I could no longer resonate with them. I had to come to terms with it. Yeah, but they like they they your guides that you were connected to engineered yeah. engineered this this moment that would close your energy centers. And but what past past this point, like what what What's gonna, you know, like what? What's gonna happen to you? Like, why? Why did the guides leave? Like, what? What's? What's the point of them leaving? Like, what are you now entering? Okay, so now that I understand retrospectively, because I, I obviously wanted to understand this too. So the reason I was drawn into the occult was I needed to explain my childhood. I needed these answers. I didn't know. I was like, why? Well, I was all I knew is I was sad. They had to go. I was unhappy. They went away, and something's changed. That thing that came into my body from my mother has changed. Like I'm different. Something's different. This isn't right. It's how it felt. And retrospectively, I understand now that at age seven, children develop an etheric body. And that etheric body is important. It's an energetic development in our aura and our chakras. And so the development of this energetic sheath um, involves it having to take a shape and a form. And because I was so open to the astral plane, it was it would have maybe prevented me from developing an etheric body. Okay. So okay. And I know you've explained karma. This. I think karma had to be imprinted into it. Okay. So I know you explained this before. But for people that maybe I, I'll share this video with or haven't heard or, or don't know what is what is the etheric? What is the astral? And and why why do you need to, I guess, develop this etheric body? Like, what is, you know, what is that? How, how is that developed? And, and another, and, and, and one more thing, I know I'm asking a lot of questions here. I get the sense that before you were, before your guys left and these energy, these energy centers were closed, up to this point, you were, you were, you were kind of just like you had these beings giving you information, and you were you were kind of uh, you doing things, you know, with with this like ancestral knowledge. Like you just you just did these things, 
Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like now you get to this point, your energy center's closed, the guys leave. Now it's like, well, you can still remember all these things, but you don't know, you don't know like like how or why. And so you're you're entering into this period where you actually have to you have to interact with with the world in a, in a, in, a, in a different way to find these answers. That's what it was. That that's I think what exactly um, exactly. So you need to develop this etheric body now. The etheric and the astral. It's easier to explain it in terms of imagine the soul, the soul body. So from a shamanic perspective, this is dream time. And this dream time is bound by three strands of dream time. We can call it the three fates. We can call it the triple goddess. We can call it the trinity. We can call it by the um, Satchitananda. We can call it um, the triad of the monad, the duad, and the triad. Um, if we, we we can call it by the um, Henry, is that you making a noise? He's dreaming. So not now, Indigo, my sweetheart. Not now, my darling. Not now. Yes, yes, I was talking to Henry. Right down, down, down. Get down. Um, she'll be all over me with her paws all over my lap and she won't stop. So the, the, the soul body has to come into the physical manifestational form. And in order for this to come into being, there has to be a polarization for all things are born of polarity. So the divine plane of the shamanic plane, you can relate that to Atsilut of the Kabbalah or the causal field or the causal body of the Vedic school. And this is... Um, the body through which we experience the Tao. And through which the Tao is transmitted if in Taoist systems. And then in a Chinese system, you've got the Shen and the Qi, two different bodies, two different frequencies. In the shamanic system, you've got the middle world and you've got the underworld, the lower world, the three sets of dream time. In the Kabbalah, you've got the Briya and you've got the Yetzira. The Yetzira is the, the formative, formative world of thoughts and the Logos logic. The Briya is the emotional plane of connections between the thoughts that are formative, informative information. And so you've got like angles and curves. The, the curves need to fit, the angles need to fit, the angels and the curves need to fit together. The angels of, of the etheric field, if we, we consider such a notion. And um, this causal body, which is your soul body, has to take on a polarization. In other words, it's got to create something outside of itself like a matrix for us to, to experience ourselves in. And in order for that matrix to be created outside of itself, it's got to be bound in a field of polarity. And that polarity then becomes what is being transmitted to us and what we're transmitting back. So the soul is transmitting to us like an internet. You've got to have a download and upload. And when you've got to download and upload, together they make bandwidth. Yeah? It's the same. So your download is your astral. 
your upload is your etheric because you've got to download your karmic imprint onto the physical so that you can continue with your last work. And then what you do in this life here has got to be able to imprint back onto the causal body so that it can continue in the next incarnation with the same line of what has happened. Right? Does that make sense? So you've got to upload your information. Now, the download is the curvature between the angles, emotional, astral. The upload is the angles, the points, the lines. Pingala, the pineal gland, the etheric field, logical, words, thoughts, thinking wheels of little thoughts that create thought forms, sacred geometric shapes, the shape of sound, where the download, the astral, is the emotion the feeling, the resonance that moves the reason, the um, quality of the sound as opposed to the shape of the sound. So the qualities are downloaded and the shapes are uploaded. And so the, sh the etheric field, which is the upload, becomes the shape of the world and the astral download becomes the, the qualities that fill the shapes, that move through the shapes, where the astral is of pure emotional. Now, in the Kabbalah, it's been wrongly, um, I believe it's been wrongly translated by all of the so-called Kabbalist masters in all of the books, because they keep talking about the astral field, but they're actually talking about the etheric. And I think it's because they probably, most of them probably had more study than they had experience. They probably more, most of them spent a lot of time in libraries. And so they, they speak of the emotional plane as being different. And it's just this, this is the emotional plane that's out there. Okay. But then there's this astral plane, which is like a real substantial plane. The emotional plane, well, they can't really put it into perspective. In the Vedic school, it's, because it's more it's, easily explained the, here. The book learning is safe. Sorry? The book learning is safe. Yeah. Yeah. It's comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when, when you put it into perspective in the Vedic, like I, I thought of it in those terms. And then I went to India and I really like, I dissected the Indian system and I thought, hold on, it's the same, but it's different. Interesting. And then I started realizing that my experiences weren't, that's why I had to go to India. Because I got to a certain point with Western occult. Because I'd met people when I was young. So when I was 12, I was reactivated. Yeah. And by spirits and beings. And suddenly I was like back in this world of like, okay, cool. Only by that stage I was I wasn't afraid. I found the whole thing a bit amusing. <laughs> it was like I was a little bit amused by it all. Yeah. And like the idea of dying, I was like, oh, I, was, I was a bit amused by the idea of dying. Huh. So I was like a bit crazy. Like I I did crazy experiments that I probably shouldn't have done, like close my eyes and walk across the highway and just see what happens. I'm curious. Yeah. How does faith work? I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get hit. Let's test this, you know? Yeah. And um, so I, I used to do crazy stuff when I was young. And um, my friends all thought, like, you had a death wish. They said, you got a death wish. You're crazy. So... But I, I, for me, it was an experiment because I didn't want to live in fear. I was like, I do not want to live in fear. I don't want to. I don't want to be afraid of dying because there's no point living if I'm afraid of dying. Yeah, that definitely, um, that definitely rings true. I can, uh, can hear the little one. She's woken up. You got to go, I, brother. So yeah, but I, I think this is a I think this is a good point to um, to end this this part of the conversation.
and next time we talk, I like the idea of a weekly thing. Um, next time we talk, we will we should pick it up with this this moment um, of uh, of the fear experience, and and we'll, we'll we'll continue to talk about where 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 it takes you next. What do you what do you say? <laughs> well, thank you, dear brother. Yeah. It feels a bit weird talking about myself so much. Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I understand. I understand. It's, yeah. it's but um, yeah, I thought this was great, man. I thought this was really great. Hey, uh, uh, technical point. So on the on the upper corner here of the screen, it says recording. There's a little red box, and it says uh, 4446. And we've been talking for longer than that. Haven't we? One, it says one hour and 40. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, 100 maybe minutes. I'm, maybe I'm, it's different on my end. Cool. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, that was good. I, that was good. I really appreciate I really appreciate you talking to me. I think this is really, really good. Well, thank you, dear brother. And yeah. um, I have an absolutely good day. I hope little Petra as well. I hope she's having a lovely lovely day i hope yeah. lauren's well and that looks pretty what is that so I go. this is a uh it's a bear claw and uh -huh. it's got some runes on it and it's uh, a talisman like a yeah yeah, yeah yeah no definitely I, yeah i i got it um i purchased it uh, from a gentleman um, named Clay Martin, who has, uh, he's an author. Uh, he's written several books. He's a uh, former um, Marine uh, Special Forces soldier at Green Beret, I think. And wow. his most recent book uh, is called Barbarian Spirit. And it chronicles his um experience with psilocybin mushrooms <laughs> it is quite an eye-opening read um and and from that from those ex from those experiences uh he developed this this talisman and so i like it <laughs> no it's uh, beautiful yeah yeah that's where it's from don't keep petra waiting too long dear brother Okay. All right, man. Much love to you. And I will talk Much to, love you, to you next okay. Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Let's do Are we it. on for next Sunday? Yeah, we'll Sending it out. you love. Peace. Okay. Blessings. Take care. Take care. Om Shanti.